first of all, I want to thank uh, Tomo and the rest of the organizers for this uh, great opportunity. I'm, uh, I'm very happy to see all this awesome work that's going on in the NEP, which is also a field that I'm extremely interested in. So, um, I'm going to talk to you today, today about the Cosmic Dawn Survey. Um, this is a survey that we are uh, heavily invested in at the new Cosmic Dawn Center, which is a, this is a new research center in, uh, in Copenhagen, focused on understanding the formation of the first uh, galaxies. So, this is a PR video that was made by ESO in connection with the detection of the highest massive galaxy we know, GN Z11, a, uh, a surprisingly massive galaxy at a redshift of 11. We only know one galaxy this far away. This would correspond to something like 400 million years after the Big Bang. And uh, it's here. It's, it's relatively large, it's uh, relatively massive, and it's surprisingly evolved already at this early time. Okay, so we want to find more of these galaxies. And as the movie illustrated, you, you don't just find them. It's really like finding a needle in a haystack. You have to go very wide because these galaxies are rare, and you also have to go very deep. You have to cover a lot of different wavelengths in order to find these galaxies and weed them out uh, from, from stars and other foreground galaxies. So almost all very high rates of galaxies we know have been selected from deep HST plus Spitzer oscillations. These are the five famous candles fields. Uh, in all of these, we only know one redshift 11 galaxy. And if we include down to a redshift minus, so we know maybe a handful. And uh, that's simply because <coughs> galaxy information is highly biased at high redshift. So you have to find the rare over density regions in order to be lucky enough to spot one of the first galaxies forming. But only 0.25 square degrees have been covered with deep enough data to select these galaxies so far. And the limiting factor is that it's very, very slow to map out large areas uh, with, uh, with Wi-Fi camera 3 and bubble, because it's a very small field of view. But in a couple of years, we will have a brand new imager on the Euclid uh, Space Telescope that in a single shot can cover twice the area of the whole candle survey, just in one shot. Okay? This will, and and it, will, it will do the same bands as Wi-Fi camera 3, uh, we have slightly larger pixels, but, uh, but galaxies will be resolved uh, still. So this is a huge uh, uh, opportunity to study the high <coughs> The Euclid mission is a cosmology mission. It will, the main mission is to determine what, uh, what the equation of state of the universe is. In other words, to try to constrain dark matter, uh, sorry, dark energy better. It will do this by mapping out 15,000 square degrees on the sky. Uh, to 24th magnitude and 3 million infrared bands. But it will also do uh, some deep field observations, which is almost exclusively for, for just exploratory science of the high risk universe. Um, in total, it will cover 50 square degrees with uh, much deeper observations, 26th uh, magnitude. One of them is the NEP. This is an illustration of uh, Euclid uh, pointings covering 10 square degrees on the NEP. Uh, and it will also have a southern, uh, oh, actually two uh, deep fields in the southern hemisphere, and some smaller ones in other well-known fields like Cosmos and SXGS. The Euclid uh, filters here, Y, J, H, are uh, exactly what you need to select galaxies at rest of 7, 8, 9, 10, and all the way out to 11. Um, so this will be a huge uh, step forward. It will not go as deep as, for example, the hubble Hooser deep field observations or some of the deep field observations that are being planned by JWST, but it will go wide. So it will, it will sample a completely different part of the UV or the mass luminosity function at high redshift. It will find the rare but very, very bright galaxies. And it will find thousands of them. You can see here, these are some numbers that, uh, that we have uh, calculated we expect to find from the, from the Euclid uh, deep fields. There will be thousands of galaxies at redshift greater than 8. And these will be galaxies that will not be uh, in a single JWST pointing, because they are too rare simply to be found unless we are extremely lucky. Mind you that all of the DTO observations 
uh, that are being planned for the first year or two for JWST. Almost all of them are done in the candles fields because you simply need uh, all this extra data to select the galaxies to look at. So they won't find these. Two of uh, the Euclid deep fields uh, can be observed from Hawaii. The North Eclipse Coal and the Chandra deep field south. So we have started what we are calling the uh, Cosmic Dawn Survey uh, to be ready for when the Euclid data comes basically. So there's a large program in Hawaii, uh, 30 nights, that will cover these two fields with the deep hypersupreme cam uh, imaging. And we have already acquired Spitzer data over both of the fields also. The Spitzer program is, is a 6,000 6, hour program, so it's almost a year of, uh, of observation time. So it's quite exciting, the Spitzer data is already, uh, has already been taken. And uh, the depth that we have used uh, uh, both for the Hybris Prime Camp and for the Spitzer is uh, a depth needed to match the depth of the Euclid data once we get it. And it's designed so that we will be able to select every massive galaxy out to a redshift of 8. So we will be able to do mass selected uh, samples out to a redshift of 8. If a galaxy is, if, is M star or greater, we will detect it. So we will have unbiased samples of the most massive galaxies to that redshift. And if brighter galaxies exist, we will see them all the way out to redshift 11. Uh, so these are the different components here. And I briefly mentioned earlier today that we recently uh, heard from the, the LMG guys that they have decided also to cover uh, the same fields. So this was, well, of course, if it works, be extremely exciting because we will have 1.1, 1.4, and 2.1 millimeter of observations uh, to very great depth and with high uh, resolution. This would give us a view of the uh, obscure star formation also at high resolutions. So why is it important to do this large area? I, I've already sort of hinted at it, but the reason is simply that if you look at it, distribution of dark matter in simulations, this is a redshift 5, and the colors here uh, correspond to, to density. The yellow ones are the highest density regions. You can see that if you just have a single candles uh, pointing here, you could easily miss the highest density regions of the universe. Even if you have five of these, chances are that you're going to miss the highest density regions, which is where the first galaxies form. This is the size of the cosmos field. And uh, you can see you can begin to sample some of the higher density regions, but you could easily still miss the very highest density ones. And those are the ones, for many reasons, that we want to find. So our hypersupreme camp survey has been going on for more than a year, but we've gotten very little data. Um, we've lost, uh, I think it's nine nights to earthquakes and hurricanes and so on. So therefore I was very happy uh, to meet you in Japan uh, so that we could uh, get started with the data that you guys have already taken. Sure, sure. And uh, with that, and, and also the HEROES data, in the NEP we are about 50% uh, complete now. And this, uh, this has been very important to show to the IFA tech that there is progress even if, uh, if, um, if, even if we've been unlucky with the weather. So, we, we haven't processed this uh, data uh, to the point where we can analyze it yet, but we have, uh, we have uh, taken uh, the Hyper Supply Camp data in, in the Cosmos field and uh, made a version to the depth that we expect from the, from the Cosmic Dawn survey, and that looks something like this. So, you can see that there's a lot of galaxies in there. And we can do, uh, as a proof of concept, we can do uh, dropout selection. These are redshift 5 galaxies in the Cosmos selected as, as R band dropouts. There's, and you, you, can, you can actually kind of see the large scale structure already, even though this is just a line and break selection. This is Richard 6, I band dropouts, and also here you can, you can see that there is structure, which doesn't look uh, too different from what we see in the dark matter simulations here, so it seems to be working. <coughs> this is very rough. It's not based, based on photosynthesis or spectral seas. This is just dropout. That's uh, true concept. What we do have is the Spitzer data, and this, uh, I think, is uh, quite jaw-dropping. <coughs> this is the full NEP, so 10 uh, square degrees. You see all these tiny little uh, Spitzer fields of view here, so this is about 3,000 hours. 
and, uh, and we can start zooming in and appreciate how many galaxies. So every little dot here is a galaxy for which we can measure. I'm zooming in. We can measure the, the, the stellar mass. So there are just an incredible amount of information in these uh, images. Okay, so why do we care about getting the large scale structure at high redshift? <coughs> this is because, in a biased way, that we want to understand cosmic realization. After, after uh, the emission of the CMB, the universe was embedded in neutral hydrogen, as you know. And uh, as we get down to uh, the formation of the first stars and galaxies, a lot of UV flux is sent out from the galaxies that form in the highest density nodes of the universe, and they start to make reionized bubbles around them. And as you go down in redshift, these bubbles expand, and eventually the whole universe is reionized. If you want to understand this process, of course we have to find the first bubbles where they first appear, and we have to trace them down in redshift and see how they grow to understand what are the sources that are responsible for this uh, last phase transition of, of the universe. Simulations uh, show, indeed, this is, this is just a different version of what I showed the movie of, that uh, uh, these are reionized bubbles. The colors correspond to the redshift where they're reionized. So you can see the red ones here uh, reionized at a, about a, a redshift of 10. And as you go down in redshift to greener and bluer colors, these bubbles expand. Okay, so we, we have to find these red bubbles. And for that, we need, we need to, uh, to, uh, to, to image a large field so we can find the highest density nodes, because this is where it's expected to happen. With, uh, with stellar masses, which is, of course, something that we only have because we have the deep near-infrared data and the deep mid-infrared data. Otherwise, you can forget about stellar mass above redshift of 2. We can start to look at very fundamental uh, relations like, for example, the stellar mass function <coughs> here. This is the stellar mass function of redshift 0. This is the underlying dark matter uh, halo mass function. And you can see the well-known uh, bend in the stellar mass function. There is, a, there is a halo mass which is most efficient for star formation. Uh, at lower masses, uh, you, you don't find enough low mass galaxies, and this is believed to be due to supernova feedback that uh, makes star formation less efficient. And at the same time, at high masses, you don't find enough very stellar massive galaxies compared to what you would expect from the from the Lambda CDM. And this is uh, this is uh, this is feedback processes that are believed to be uh, responsible for this. In this work from Cosmos, you can see as we go to higher and higher redshift that the shape of the stellar mass function start, start to change and become more and more like the underlying uh, halo dark matter uh, distribution function. And this is taken as a hint that whatever process is uh, responsible uh, for inhibiting star formation at high masses and low masses is, is starting to not to work anymore because we're getting we're getting so close to the initial formation of the galaxies that, for example, ATN feedback has not had time to, to work yet. But you can also see that there are huge uncertainties here, basically because uh, the, the field of view uh, is too small to find the rare massive galaxies. With the Cosmic Dawn Survey, we, we have a dream scenario where we can uh, determine, for example, the stellar mass function all the way out to redshift of 10 with these uh, sort of uh, uh, arrow bars on it. And because we can, uh, we have so good statistics and we know all of the, uh, we, can, we can calculate the clustering of galaxies, for example, we, we can also link galaxies directly to their dark matter halos. We can use, for example, abundance matching and we can uh, calculate the stellar to halo mass uh, function, which is illustrated here, all the way up to redshift of 10. We can also look at the, stellar, uh, uh, the star forming main sequence all the way to the same redshift, if it exists. And this should give us fundamental new insight into, into galaxy formation. So, yes, so now uh, this, is, this is the final slide. Uh, there were some people who also wanted to talk about PFS, and we can, we, maybe we can do that during the, the discussion session. Well, thank you. Okay, questions, comments? Yes. So, uh, with Dawn's survey 
also going to observe narrowband filter uh, observation with hyperspin film cam. Because you just show the dropout galaxy. So I'm wondering, I'm interested in know whether uh, narrowband observation will come out or not. Well, we would love to do that, but yeah. it's not currently in the, in the plans, but that's something we would love to do. Yeah. I should say that uh, yeah. we, we are not going to rely on drop-up selection. We, we're going to do mass selected samples. Uh, even at the highest redshift, if we select galaxies at 4.5 micron, mm -hmm. it's the same as, uh, as select, uh, doing K-selected uh, samples at redshift 1. Uh, so we will, we will start with the infrared, mm -hmm. and then we will, we will base our selection on photometric redshifts. And if we get PFS time, then also spectroscopic versions. Okay. Thank you. So you should, you should write a proposal. Now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're figuring it out. So I think this, of course, as I said, is the greatest project <laughs> in the universe. But um, the, for the really big payoffs at the high rate, just four, five, six, seven, eight, and so on, you really are using the line and break method. I understand you want to do photometric redshifts, but I think, <coughs> correct me, I still think that it has to show a Lyman break. Yeah, no, get Lyman break, which would be And important. so, yeah. as you know, in order to see a Lyman break, you have to have a substantially strong amount of UV continuum from yeah. star formation. So, I'm asking you anyway, is it, this survey will tell us about the unobscured star forming properties, some we don't know, but I mean, some people think that there might be as many uh, obscured galaxies that will not be in your survey. I mean, at the same mass. The beauty is, though, that this survey is designed to be mass complete, still mass complete. So you're so saying we don't we don't care about the dust. You don't care about the dust. You don't care about the star formation rate. If we can measure the star formation rate, then uh, we should get every every galaxy that's massive because we can do the selection on the rest frame optical. If so, there are some super dusty ones, then I would say we'll see that. Super dusty. I mean, so, so how do you find, a, I just, what, what does it look like? It's a galaxy at a redshift of six or whatever you like, which is, I don't know, forming 10 solar masses a year or whatever, and it has a, a few magnitudes of visual extinction. So how do you find it there? The UV is, the rest frame UV is really killed. We should still see it in the uh, in the rest frame optical. Yes, you would. Yes, you will certainly detect it in the rest frame optical because you have very nice infrared data, and it will be a very red thing. Yeah. So how do you know that it's at a redshift of six instead of just at a redshift of two? If it's extremely dusty, then uh, you know, then any spectral break that is essential for getting a, an accurate photometric redshift. I see. So uh, you will use real, like the bomber break. The bomber break, for example. Uh, but if you if you add dust on top of that, it will still be difficult to get a, a precise photometric redshift. I guess, as you say, it, it's sort of a quantitative thing. It depends on how, what you mean by dusty. To two magnitudes, three magnet, yeah, it just depends. But okay, it's worth a shot. Yeah. For, for, and for, for example, like with barons, so uh, post double scale double D, if you have a Bauman break, you can still detect it with with the filters. Yeah. Yeah. That's on the on the redshift, of course. Mm -hmm. But yeah. So unless unless it's extremely dusty, you can still pick it up at the great yeah. redshift. All you all you need to have a photometric redshift is some break, uh, whether it's the Bomber break or it's the Lyman break. Okay. You need some break, otherwise mm -hmm. it becomes uncertain. Okay. Uh, but that's also why we are, we are, we want to do a a big PFS program on on this sample. I have a very small question about the mass function and the function of red shift. So you show the mass function of stellar mass function and dark material mass function. Mm -hmm. And then at a very high Z, so our mass then looks like uh, it's um, our stellar mass function is beyond or the, yeah. uh, there is any something. Yeah. What, what happens to that? Well, first of all, um, mm -hmm. what you should notice is this. So the, the Hamer mass function is, is really up here. We've just we've just scaled it so it so it hits uh, the stellar mass function here yeah. for better comparison, right? But if this is I mean this is highly uncertain. It's based on a couple of galaxies. But if this is true, that it starts to overshoot the yeah. halo mass function, then lambda CM has a problem. Uh -huh. Because that is from observation. This is observation. Yeah. Okay. 
if it gets into the gray area here, then then you are really in trouble oh. uh, because this is this is yeah. this is uh, illegal space based on the uh, of just uh, the balance <laughs> fraction of the universe. Mm -hmm. So, but these are the things that you can if you can if you can get ten thousand times better statistics here, mm -hmm. and you can push it. This is Redshift five, but we can push this all the way out to yes, Redshift eight or ten. Oh, I then, then, then maybe this problem will sharpen and become interesting. But mm. you will not get uh, Yari Davidson, who, who wrote this paper, mm. to even raise an eyebrow over this and say, "Well, forget about it. It's too uncertain." Uh, yeah. But, but I want to suggest that there's something interesting maybe going on. Is there a positive effect on the supplementation? I mean, this is a positive effect, right? So, Asian never suppress the supplementation. This increases. Yeah, yeah. So it looks like what he will tell you is that the shape of the mass event here looks almost the same as the underlying dark matter. Oh, really? Shape. Oh, it's in there. Yeah. Yeah. right? So this, this will tell you that whatever uh, time scale that the AGN needs to work, mm. it has not been long enough at this high resolution. Mm. Any last question? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so you said that you have a 